It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 124, for broadcast on the 16th of October, 2023. Coming up on Space Time, Australia's first nuclear fusion reactor, Earth's largest ever solar storm, and another Russian segment of the International Space Station springs a leak. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The University of New South Wales in Sydney has announced plans to develop Australia's first nuclear fusion tokamak. Tokamaks are one of the technologies being tried around the world to achieve reliable, safe thermonuclear fusion for power generation. Scientists see nuclear fusion as a limitless and clean method of energy production using nothing but seawater that will ultimately help end things like global warming and climate change. Now, nuclear fusion is very different from nuclear fission used in current nuclear power stations. Nuclear fission is the process in which uranium atoms are split apart, releasing a tremendous amount of energy to heat water, make steam and spin turbines to generate electricity. And unfortunately, as a byproduct, it also produces high levels of radioactive waste. More than 10% of the world's electricity currently comes from nuclear power plants. But unlike nuclear fission, nuclear fusion is clean and limitless. Recently, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's National Ignition Facility in California used ultra-short bursts of 192 high-powered lasers to achieve nuclear fusion in a hydrogen pellet. The lasers produced over 2 million joules of energy in a sudden burst lasting just a nanosecond. That's a thousand millionth of a second. This generated the extreme temperatures and pressures needed to trigger a fusion reaction by heating and compressing the hydrogen isotopes to just a fraction of their normal size, forcing them to fuse together to make helium and releasing high-energy neutrons. In the sun, this process happens naturally, where core temperatures exceed 15 million degrees Celsius and pressures reach 3.84 trillion pounds per square inch. That's 26.5 petapascals. But duplicating these extreme conditions on Earth has proven to be far more difficult, and the process has become the holy grail of fusion research ever since the 1950s. Laser fusion ignition is one of two paths that physicists are following in their quest to achieve nuclear fusion. The other involves magnetic confinement fusion, in which a superheated plasma is contained in a torus or donut-shaped vacuum chamber ring called a tokamak using powerful magnets. The plasma is made up of heavy and super-heavy isotopes of hydrogen known as deuterium and tritium. Normal hydrogen, also known as protium, consists of just a single proton in its nucleus orbited by an electron. Deuterium differs in that the nucleus also contains a neutron, and tritium has a proton and two neutrons in its nucleus. These isotopes are heated to between 150 and 300 million degrees Celsius by powerful electric currents within the tokamak ring. At these extreme temperatures, electrons are ripped off their atoms, forming a charged plasma of hydrogen ions. This is where the magnets come in. They can find this highly charged, high-temperature plasma to an extremely small area within the ring, thereby maximising the chance of the superheated ions fusing together and giving off energy. It also keeps this hot plasma away from the sides of the torus. Now, the heat generated through this process can be used to turn water into steam, which spins turbines, producing electricity. So far, more than 200 experimental tokamaks have been built worldwide, but today they've all consumed more energy than what they produce. 
the massive international tokamak project ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, is currently under construction in southern France, with the aim of starting operations in 2027. Meanwhile, physicists in Germany are using a complicated variation of the tokamak known as the Stolerator. It uses a twisting ring design with changes in geometry and differing magnetic fields. These control the plasma for longer periods of time compared to the short bursts tokamaks usually achieve. The University of New South Wales nuclear fusion device will be wholly designed, developed, built and operated by students. The project's headed by nuclear engineering expert Patrick Burr and aims to have a working device operating within two to three years. The university's tokamak will be small, just a metre by a metre, and this early tokamak design will potentially be followed by other devices, also aiming to achieve nuclear fusion, possibly using different methods, such as high-powered lasers. The program is being supported by engineering partners Tokamak Energy and HB11 Energy. Burr says the project will be the first in the world where students will design, build and manage a fusion reactor. A tokamak is a donut-shaped machine that contains effectively a vacuum, but with a little bit of gas. So it's not complete vacuum. It's neither a vacuum, but then we put in some hydrogen isotopes. And then it's got three very large sets of magnets. Uh, magnets going uh, around the circumference, magnets going around sort of in the other direction of the donut, if you imagine, and a big magnet in the middle. And what all those magnets do is that they spin around the atoms that are inside the vacuum, and they spin them very, very, very fast until the well, they are ionized atoms, so they've been stripped of the electrons, and they get spun very, very quickly until the force that they have when they collide on one another is enough to overcome the natural repulsion. Now, when two atoms bump against one another, they, they will naturally bump and just move on. They repel. But if you can get them to collide really, really fast, they will get beyond the natural repulsion and actually fuse together. And when that happens, you get fusion. So a tokamak is one of the ways in which you can achieve fusion by accelerating a plasma, so a gas of charged particles inside a vacuum chamber. And they're building a big one of those in France right now, aren't they? Absolutely. The ITER is definitely the biggest tokamak that has ever been built so far, though it's actually dwarfed by the one that will succeed that called DEMO. So yes, there is an international consortium. It's been built in France, but it actually involves many countries, including Australia, in fact, that everyone has been contributing to the development of that mammoothal the machine. It takes a lot of energy to run these things, but if you fuse enough hydrogen into helium, there's enough residual energy produced that there's a little bit more energy than what it takes to make that thing in the first place. And that's the aim of the exercise. Absolutely. And in fact, the point of ITER is to demonstrate that well, we already know we can get more energy out than we put in. So fusion is really an energy amplifier, right? You need a huge amount of energy to make it go, but then you get a bit more energy out. And it is really about demonstrating the technologies, about the magnets, about the materials, about the controls, the diagnostics that will allow us to control this for useful kind of skills, right? How is the tokamak different from what the Germans are doing with their Stellarator design? Well, a Stellarator is not that similar in the sense that it's also toroid. So it's effectively another donut-shaped machine. But the difference there is that it's a very, very complicated, twisted shape of a donut. It's and the reason for that... eddies and things like this. Well, the, the, the reason is, it, it's the simplest way to explain it is this, that a tokamak is it's very simple to build in principle because you've got only three sets of magnets, but it's actually very difficult to operate because the plasma, so this current of fast-moving atoms inside it, they don't want to stay around in a nice circular shape. They will tend to try and escape. And you're constantly controlling the current in all the magnets to try and keep the plasma do what you want it to do. Well, accelerator, on the other hand, is excruciatingly difficult to design because the magnets have this really complicated, twisted shape. But the idea is that once you've managed to do that, the control of the plasma is really, really easy because it naturally wants to remain where it is. And so you've basically 
move the problem of a difficult control of the plasma to a problem of difficult construction of really tight tolerances in your magnet design. But the concept is very similar otherwise. They've recently in the United States achieved fusion twice now, but they're using a different system, aren't they? They're using one involving lasers. Yes, that's correct. Well, I, I should clarify, actually, fusion has been achieved many times, hundreds of times. What's really been achieved in the United States, as you were referencing to at the National Ignition Facility, is that twice they managed to get more energy out then they put in. And that's a big, big step forward for the fusion community. But you're right, they haven't done that with a tokamak or with a accelerator. They've done that using lasers. We talk about getting more energy out. Yeah. But there is a very important point there that at the moment, they've only got a little bit out, like a tiny little bit more. The idea is that you need to get five times or even 10 times more energy out before it becomes commercially viable. And they've got to be able to do it consistently too, don't they? They're not, not just one burst. Absolutely. And that is the exact point that we're working on here at Unistabli. It's about working away from, let's see what are the conditions we can achieve and how good is our fusion to how consistently can we do it? Can we move from milliseconds to seconds to hours to days? Because in order to provide electricity to the grid, it's no good to have energy, but only for a few seconds. You need to have energy for hours or days at a time. And there are really many, many different ways in which you can do fusion. And in fact, there are some 50 plus companies in the world all sort of racing to be the first one to build a commercial fusion reactor. And they're all pursuing very different technologies. But broadly speaking, you either use magnets or you use lasers. And in both cases, what you're trying to do is accelerate atoms fast enough that they collide together and fuse together. Then with lasers, all you're doing is imparting a lot of energy to the atoms from all directions at the same time. And so you're compressing atoms together. And that's what the sun does naturally in its core. Exactly, absolutely. Except what the sun does it using gravity, actually, because it can. <laughs> it's enormous. You guys are planning to build a tokamak. Tell me about it. Yeah, so this will be the very first tokamak that is entirely designed, built, and operated by students. So that's what is innovative about our tokamak. It will be very small scale, at least the first iteration. And I say the first iteration because a key part of this project is that we're not going to build one and then that's it. We're going to use it for research. And that's basically the history of all tokamaks that have been built in history. And there's been several tens of them. But our goal is to build one. And as soon as we built it and, and showed what it can do, it start building the next one and make it better, faster, stronger and everything. And this iterative process of making our reactors, keeping them quite small so we can meet the rate at a rate of about one new device every two years, roughly, means that we can really learn very fast and we can really push the boundary of what is possible at a much faster pace. It really speeds up the learning curve. And by doing that, we hope to help our industry partners. They're aiming to build commercial fusion reactors. But the challenge that they have is that they have a lot of engineering challenges, which is a good, that's the good news, right? Engineering challenges is better than physics challenges. You know, we don't have to discover new physics. We understand the physics. We now need to just deal, well, just in inverted commas, deal with the engineering challenges to make it feasible. But they've got lots of challenges and they have to solve all of them in order to have a commercial reactor. What we're going to do is in each iteration of the device, we're going to focus on one challenge and just that one single challenge and we're going to spend two years trying to solve that one. And for instance, that might be, can we push the limit of what the strength of the magnets that we can have on the tokamak so that we can control a, a plasma with a higher density, but the machine doesn't want to rip itself apart because there are huge forces in part by the magnets. Or can we design materials that withstand higher temperatures? Because these reactors operate at about 100 million degrees C. So can we design materials that can withstand those temperatures for long enough before we need to replace them? Those are the sorts of challenges that we hope to help accelerate the development of for our industry partners. And that's part of the concept of using magnets around the tokamak to keep the plasma in the center of the donut device so that it doesn't uh, touch the edges, right? Absolutely correct. So in the ideal world, your very, very hot plasma never touches the edges, right? And so it doesn't destroy your material and the plasma doesn't cool down either. So that's great. But in reality, it's actually very difficult to control the plasma. And there will be occasionally, and sometimes not so occasionally, deviations from that optimal point, right? So you have to make engineering materials that can withstand those transients, those deviations from the ideal setting. And one great thing about our device is that once we build it, we're straight on moving on to the next one, which means that we have a device that we can use for those more destructive type of testing that normally you wouldn't do on a machine that has taken you 10 years to build and several million dollars to build, which is do 
doing those tests to, to understand what happens to the machine and to the components of the machine when you have a transient in your plasma, for instance. The mantra I keep hearing is always, it's about 10 years away. It's been about 10 years away for quite some time now. What's the horizon look like? Well, you see, the, the, that's you know the joke that has been existing in the future community forever. But there's actually a joke about the joke. You know, I first heard that when I started my PhD, and that was about 15 years ago. And they used to say, when I first heard that joke, they said, oh, fusion is 30 years away, and has always been 30 years away. Yeah. That has kind of changed its tone, and then it became 20 years, and most recently 15, and you just said 10. And guess what? In 15 years, the goal has moved from 30 years to 10 years. I think that's a success yeah, goal, bad. right? So, oh, um, yeah, yeah. Th- no, but jokes aside, the truth is this. The goal does not change if the milestone that when you will achieve fusion does not change unless you put invest into it, right? So if you need 30 years of development in order to make it happen and you don't put money into it, it's never, no one's going to make that development and it's almost going to be 30 years away. What's yeah. really happened in the last 10 years and especially in the last five years, it's an unprecedented level of investment, not just from governments and uh, national labs, as it's historically always been the case, like ITER is the example we we're talking about before. But now there are a very large number of startups and private companies that have found private investment to do research in fusion, to develop fusion machines. And I don't know much about private investors, but I do know that people don't put money into something unless they get a return in it. So to me, this is a strong sign that the private investment sector sees that this is getting close to reality and they're going to get a return on their money in a reasonable time scale. And that's really what's kickstarting all this accelerated development of fusion. And we hope to be a part of that. Where are you going to build it? We're going to build it at UNSW Sydney in the Kensington campus and once it's built it will be open at some days of the year for the public to see and we hope to also wheel it out to some of the events to show the world. Have you got firm designs? We don't have firm designs and that goes part of the core of what we're doing. It's going to be entirely designed and built with students but we have a parameter space in which to work in. So we know already that it will be roughly one meter in diameter so that gives you a sense of scale. It's not going to be very big and that's part of the design criteria. However, that's the device itself. Uh, you very quickly realize that everything that needs to go around it from the diagnostics to the power sources is really quite big. The power source itself might be about 10 times the size of the device. So that gives you a sense of scale of what we're trying to build. Why a tokamak? That's a very good question. Thank you, Stuart. Well, tokamak is the most mature technology in terms of fusion energy, but by all means, we're not set to only build tokamaks. In fact, the, whilst the first design will be a tokamak, we hope that we will be able to explore other technologies, in particular laser technology and laser boron proton fusion, which is um, uh, pioneered, was actually in fact pioneered here at UNSW, and we're working with a Sydney-based company called HP11, and we hope to do some devices of that type as well. We are very technology agnostic, and we just hope to be able to help the entire fusion industry, whatever flavor of reactor design they're planning to build. That's Patrick Burr, a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and this is Space Time. Still to come, Earth's largest ever solar storm and another leak in the Russian segment of the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have discovered evidence of what may well be the largest ever solar storm to hit planet Earth. The massive geomagnetic storm was identified by a huge spike in radiocarbon levels 14,300 years ago, discovered during an analysis of ancient tree rings found in the French Alps. A similar solar storm today would be absolutely catastrophic for our technological society. It would potentially cost billions, wiping out telecommunications and navigation systems, destroying satellites, causing massive electricity grid blackouts, and hitting astronauts with high doses of radiation. The findings, reported in the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, reveal new insights into the sun's extreme weather and the risks that poses for the planet. The authors measured radiocarbon levels in ancient trees preserved within the eroded banks of the Durettes River near Gap in the southern French Alps. The tree trunks, which were subfossils, meaning whose fossilization process has not been complete, were sliced into tiny tree rings. 
and analysis of these individual tree rings identified an unprecedented spike in radiocarbon levels occurring precisely 14,300 years ago. By comparing the radiocarbon spike with measurements of beryllium, a chemical element found in Greenland ice cores, the authors proposed that the spike was caused by a massive solar storm, which would have ejected huge volumes of energetic particles into Earth's atmosphere. The study's lead author, Edward Bard, from the College of France, says radiocarbon is constantly being produced in the upper atmosphere through a chain reaction initiated by cosmic rays. Recently, scientists found that extreme solar events, including solar flares and coronal mass ejections, can also create short-term bursts of energetic particles, which are then preserved as huge spikes in radiocarbon production occurring over the course of just a single year. The researchers say that this occurrence of similar massive solar storms today would be catastrophic for a modern technological society. They warn that it's critical to understand the future risks of events like this in order to enable better protection, build resilience into communications and energy systems, and shield them from the potential damage. You see, extreme solar storms can have huge impacts on Earth. A sudden flood of charged particles reaching power lines will overload transformers, causing them to blow. Now, sure, you can replace one or two transformers, but having to replace hundreds, even thousands at one time would take years. The result would mean huge widespread power blackouts lasting for ages. And of course, these same solar storms would also damage spacecraft, affecting global communication and navigation systems. And that can happen in one of two ways. Either the spacecraft itself can have its circuits fried, or the spacecraft's life could be shortened by expanding the Earth's atmosphere, which would cause greater atmospheric drag for an orbiting spacecraft that would cause them to lose altitude, meaning more fuel would have to be used in order to regain a higher orbit. As far as we know, nine such extreme solar storms, known as Mayek events, have now been identified as having occurred over the past 1,500 years. The most recent confirmed Mayeka event occurred in the year 993, with another one in the year 774. But this newly identified 14,300-year-old storm is, however, the largest that has ever been found, roughly twice the size of the other two. The exact nature of these Mayeka events remain poorly understood. That's because they've never been directly observed or monitored with instruments but they highlight that we still have much to learn about the behaviour of the sun and the dangers it poses to society on Earth. We simply don't know what causes such extreme solar storms to occur, how frequently they really occur, and if there's anything we can do to predict them. Baird points out that direct instrumental measurements of solar activity really only began in the 17th century with the start of people counting sunspots. Nowadays, of course, very detailed records are kept using ground and space-based observatories. However, these relatively short-term instrumental records are insufficient for a complete understanding of the sun. Radiocarbon measured in tree rings used alongside beryllium in the polar ice cores provides the best way to understand the sun's behaviour further back into the past. Right now, the largest directly observed solar storm, which occurred back in 1859, is known as the Carrington Event. It caused massive disruption on Earth, destroying telegraph machines and creating nighttime aurorae so bright you could read a paper without turning on a light. However, the Mayaki events, including this newly discovered 14,300-year-old storm, would have been a staggering entire order of magnitude greater in size. This is space time. Still to come, another leak from the Russian segment of the International Space Station, and later in the science report, the World Meteorological Organization says planet Earth's just experienced its hottest September on record. All that and more still to come on space time. The Nauka Multipurpose Logistics Laboratory Module on the Russian segment of the International Space Station has sprung a coolant leak. It's the third leak involving a cooling system aboard a Russian-made spacecraft in less than a year, and that's raising new concerns about the reliability of Moscow's space program. 
Similar coolant leaks hit both the Soyuz MS-22 capsule in December last year and the Progress MS-21 cargo ship in February this year, both while they were attached to the International Space Station. The latest leak was discovered when flakes of frozen coolant were seen spraying into space from the module's external backup radiator circuit during a live feed of the Russian orbital Nauka lab and later confirmed in radio chatter between US mission control and astronauts. It took more than 10 years longer to build than expected. And after it finally reached orbit in 2021, it suffered more problems In fact, just hours after being attached to the space station, its main thrusters suddenly began firing all by themselves, sending the entire space station spinning out of control. Crews were forced to fire other opposing thrusters in order to try and counter the effect of the Nauka thrusters, which couldn't be turned off until they had exhausted their entire fuel supply. As for this latest problem, well, the Russian space agency Roscosmos says temperatures aboard the space station remain normal despite the latest incident. That's because the module's primary radiator remained working nominally, providing full cooling to the module. When these leaks first began occurring, Roscosmos put them down to micrometeoroid impacts. But with three leaks involving the same equipment, that's raising real concerns about the reliability of Russian manufacturing. You see, the coolant leaks aren't isolated incidents. Air leaks venting atmosphere into space have regularly affected other Russian equipment on the space station, including a leaky Soyuz capsule which was docked to the orbiting outpost and several air leaks in other Russian modules, some of which have been patched, but others are in such inaccessible areas they can't be fixed. And so, thanks to these Russian modules, the space station will always be leaking oxygen. And it's not just leaks. Back in 2018, there was a near-fatal ascent abort just two minutes into the flight of a manned Soyuz bound for the space station. That was eventually blamed on a strap-on booster being wrongly attached and consequently slamming into the core stage of the Soyuz rocket instead of flipping away. The International Space Station remains one of the few areas of cooperation still going on between Moscow and the West in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the international sanctions which have been imposed as a result. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The World Meteorological Organization says planet Earth has just experienced its hottest September on record and by a record-breaking margin. September had an average surface temperature of 16.38 degrees Celsius. That's a full half degree above the temperature for the previous warmest September back in 2020 and about 1.75 degrees Celsius warmer for the month of September compared to pre-industrial references from the 1850s to the 1900s. According to the World Meteorological Organization, the current extended streak of high land and sea surface temperatures is an ominous signal about the speed with which greenhouse gases are changing our climate. They say 2023 is now on track to be the warmest year on record. A new study claims eating grapes could be good for eye health. The findings, reported in the journal Food and Function, examine the impact of regular grape consumption on macular pigment accumulation and other biomarkers of eye health. Statistics shows us that an aging population has a higher risk of eye disease and vision problems. Key risk factors for eye disease include oxidative stress and high levels of ocular advanced glycation end products. The 16-week study involved 34 people consuming either 1.5 cups of grapes per day or a placebo. And the grape eaters showed a significant increase in macular pigment optical density, plasma antioxidant capacity and total phenolic content compared to those on the placebo. Those who didn't consume grapes also saw a significant increase in harmful advanced end products as measured in the skin. The study is the first to show that grape consumption beneficially impacts eye health in humans. A new study has found that cats purr differently to what was previously thought. Cats are vocal creatures. They meow, they squeak, they screech and they purr. 
From a voice production point of view, the meows, squeaks and screeches aren't particularly special. They're sounds generated by the cat's larynx of voice box, just like the vocalisation in humans and many other mammals. In contrast, a cat's purr was long believed to be exceptional. Research dating back half a century suggested that the purrs were being produced by a special mechanism through the cyclic contraction and relaxation of muscles in the vocal folds within the larynx, thereby requiring constant neural input and control from the brain. However, a new study by the University of Vienna now demonstrates that these cyclic muscle contractions are not needed to generate cat purrs. Data from a controlled laboratory experiment shows that the domestic cat's larynx can produce impressively low-pitched sounds at purring frequencies without any cyclic neural input or repetitive muscle contractions being needed. They say the observed sound production mechanism is actually strikingly similar to human creaky voice. Back in May last year, we ran a scientifically accurate story in our Australian Skeptics report exposing a pseudoscientific scam by anti-vaxxers falsely claiming that they can remove vaccines from the bodies of people who were vaccinated but later change their minds. In other words, they claim they could de-vaccinate people. Well, we cried bulldust on that. However, last month, fact-checkers from YouTube decided to remove the story, wrongly claiming that it was spreading medical misinformation and was in breach of their community guidelines. Because our story is medically and scientifically accurate, we stand by it, and we regard this as a case of putting truth to power. We say YouTube's so-called fact-checkers are wrong in fact, and so should be permanently removed from their jobs. We asked YouTube to appear on our show to explain their decision so we can better understand their reasoning and exactly what they're claiming was medical misinformation. See, we found no misinformation and none of the medical experts we consulted found any misinformation either. But surprise, surprise, YouTube have declined. Luckily, Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics, who was part of that original story, wasn't so reticent. You wonder if they were objecting to it because it contained medical misinformation, regardless that we were actually criticising it. But because it was in there, they then decided to ban it. It's like if you're giving a speech and you you quote a out-and-out neo-Nazi or racist or something as as a five words the start of your speech, the whole speech gets scrubbed. But I don't know if that was the case. You don't get a chance to argue back, do you? Firstly, what they said wasn't a fact because the, there was nothing wrong in in our story. Our story was stating a scientific fact that you cannot de-vaccinate someone who is being vaccinated because that's not how vaccines work they don't stay in the bloodstream for a thousand years they do what they're supposed to do then they die and disappear that was what we were saying in the story and yet these fact checkers or in this case fact fictionizers were at odds with that and they seemed most upset when we challenged them how dare we challenge them we originally got this story from the conversation which is a a series of articles regularly published from academics around the world it's a good source of information they're often short reading they're often short articles about 900 words i know exactly because I copy some of them from our magazine, which we're allowed to do. Um, And they publish a lot of these things. You just go to the conversation and look it up and you'll find a lot of articles on a whole range of different topics, some of which I disagree with. A lot of them are fine. This was a story called No, You Cannot De-Vaccinate Yourself. And it specifically referred to some treatments that were being suggested, which including snake venom kits and cupping or bleach as well, having a bath in bleach. The snake venom kits are notoriously poor at withdrawing snake venom, and that's when you use them straight away. Someone suggested that their effectiveness of removing venom, they get about 0.04% of the venom out. And at the same time, they probably cause more damage to the soft tissue around where you're applying it than just leaving it there. And then there's the cupping, which is the little glass bowls. You heat up the air inside it with a, with a match or that's a taper like or something. sucking the you, poison out again, I tell you. And you suck the poison out. Now, often the sucking just goes straight onto the skin. In this case, they're talking about putting a little cut in the skin and then putting the glass on top of it to draw out the nastiness through the cut. This is probably dangerous because you're going to damage the tissue around where the cut is. And in any case, that would only affect things on the very surface or you know just below the surface of the skin. It's not going to go deep into your body and remove a vaccine, which, as you say, has probably by that stage sort of passed through. It was passed through everything and then it's sort of dissipating. As for recommending bathing in bleach or baking soda or bathing in bleach doesn't sound like a good idea to me. And I don't know how that's supposed to get the vaccine out. So anti-vaccine move think up any excuse they can to help their clientele and these things just didn't work for various reasons. One, that's not how you get rid of vaccines. You can't get rid of vaccines anyway, once it's in. And these technologies don't work in any case, whether it's vaccines or not. 
So it's surprising that YouTube would ban that story. I occasionally get banned on Tumblr because they say my images are pornographic. They're actually images of planets and things like this. But <laughs> the, the, the computer sees a certain colour and it thinks, oh, this must be a naked lady. And it hears the word Venus or Uranus. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, so it's it's the same situation where someone can complain. Now, presumably, this was someone who's supporting sort of vaccine removal. Oh, yeah. Complains about a story and it just gets taken down. That's a bit sort of severe. And yeah. then we yes. challenged it and the YouTube fact checkers, and I use that term very loosely because they're not checking facts. They're obviously using their own opinions. Either they didn't understand the article because they're not very bright or alternatively, they did understand the article and they're actually in support of the idea of these de-vaccination things, which is scientific scientifically unsound and medically uh, ridiculous. But nevertheless, um, that's what they did. And I thought it was important that uh, you have a chance to rebuff their claims and uh, we'll get this on air before they decide to fact check this and ban this episode <laughs> as well, which is probably what they'll do if they follow a course. There could be a third reason, of course, is that there's so much garbage on YouTube that they're sort of like the clerk in the office going, stamp, 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 stamp. Oh, kill stamp. them all and let God sort them out in heaven, yeah. In a way, yeah, and, and just because they just don't have time. Someone complains about something, oh, yeah, I approve that, bang, bang, bang. They're not fact-checking, they're not even checking, perhaps. And, of course, as soon as they hear that, <laughs> the story will be wiped again. But, uh, you know, yes, I mean, they either don't know something or they're sympathetic or they just don't have time to check. They someone. don't know something, then they shouldn't be making a judgment. If they're sympathetic, yes. then they shouldn't be making a judgment. And if they don't have time to check, guess what? They, they shouldn't, shouldn't be, be making, making a judgment. <laughs> yes. So, YouTube, the ball's in your court. But it's the same applies to all the social media. Social media is so rife with... Um, phony fact-checkers. Phony fact... Well, phony stuff and then phony fact-checking, yeah. It was Meta who admitted that fact-checking is uh, is, uh, is simply opinion. Yeah, well... They admitted okay, that in they court. They did research. They admitted that in court, that fact-checking is simply opinion. And as we always say, do your own research. <laughs> exactly. It's best thing to do. It's what we do. Yeah. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 